to what I think should be, oh, let's see, what are we going to call this? I think it's the lecture 15. Is that right? Yes. Sid, do you remember? Thanks. Let's call it wireless without battery 16. And uh, today's topic, we are going to talk about Backscatter demodulation and detection. We're going to develop a channel model for this. We started a little bit into this at the end of the last section. And this is a useful channel model because for a lot of reasons. We cover the fundamentals. Because um, most people have encountered some sort of matched filter if you've been in ele electrical engineering long enough. The idea of correlating pulses to provide the optimal detector, the optimal linear detector uh, for a signal that's coming into an additive white noise Gaussian channel. Um, the, the reason why this is a nice thing to review the fundamentals on is because it, it tells you also how to deal with a non-white or a colored noise situation. How do you detect a signal? a digital signal in particular that's coming through uh, a channel that may not have additive white Gaussian noise. It may have frequency selective distortions or non-white colored noise that would otherwise destroy, distort or destroy your ability to detect a signal. This is a general purpose problem. It turns out that in some ways this problem resembles a lot of uh, communications channels that we used to use and, and still do in the world of optical or magnetic memory or media. You know, how do you read an optical um, disc where you shine a laser on it and you look at the spinning disc and on top of the spinning disc is sort of interference that is n noisy and not, not additive white Gaussian noise. It's different. Or if you use a, a magnetic read head for like an old hard drive platter, um, that communications channel and going from the magnetic recording to the wireless, the, the magnetic head that's not even making contact and it's just sweeping over the surface measuring changes in flux, that's an AC coupled communication system and that introduces frequency selectivity both to the channel and the noise that comes through. Um, so some of the things that we'll talk about today and the next class period have to do with sending data across channels like that. And it borrows a lot of old ideas uh, from magnetic or recording technology in order to do that. It never goes out of style. It just changes the form in which you have to deal with the, the problem. OK, so to this end, let's start off. And most of what I talk about today is going to come from this uh, paper that I wrote with my students and I uh, should be online already. I'll double check it if, if it isn't and upload it. We've got a nice mass of papers online now. We should put them all together in a compendium and uh, publish it. We have a textbook for the class. So yeah, module. this is the uh, paper I wrote with my students called Modulation and Sensitivity Limits for Backscatter Receivers. So here's our problem. We would like to use modulated backscatter to pull information off of a very low-powered communicator, one that's only using load modulation. And of course, what does that look like? There's an oscillator at our reader. You would amplify that signal and transmit it out of a transmit antenna. A wave goes to a tag which then reflects back with modulation to a receiver antenna, which of course has some sort of low noise amplifier in front of it and you would take two branches of that signal and copies of your original oscillator 
these through high pass filters, HPFs. to get an in-phase and a quadrature baseband signal out. Now, this diagram that I've shown here to the left is a special kind of receiver that we call a direct down conversion. This receiver. In older textbooks, you'll often call it, heard hear this called a homodyne receiver seeing a single frequency seat receiver because this oscillator is really the only oscillator that's being used for the whole operation. It's sending out a signal and then that exact same oscillator is being used to mix down the signal to I and Q. This is actually not how a, a regular receiver would operate. If you have any type of normal RF receiver, what you probably do first is you mix it down to some intermediate frequency in the low megahertz, for example. And then you either mix down further, or in some instances, you run it straight into an analog and digital converter, and then do your operations on those signals. The homodyne receiver was actually how the world's first radios were built. But they found that it was a very difficult way to do radio, because you either had to do all of your processing at RF, where it's difficult to b build filters and amplifiers and high-Q components and things that aren't loss lossy, or you have to do it down at baseband. And one of the problems with doing it all the way down at baseband, going from RF straight to baseband, is that, for example, at this location here, let me highlight it with red, you have a, a copy of your oscillator coming down and your signal at the exact same frequency here. Well, there's an issue here because most mixers do not have um, most mixers have a problem with basically self-mixing. So a little bit of this carrier will leak onto this signal here and mix with itself on the output at that location. Well, what's a, what's a carrier mixed with itself? What is it? Cosine, let's say you have a cosine 2 pi ft. If you mix it with itself, you're just squaring it. And of course, you can apply that trigonometry, trigonometry identity where you get basically a DC term and then a carrier that's twice the frequency. Well, this one probably doesn't even make it through the system because this is, would be very high in frequency. It would be significantly attenuated. But this guy is a problem. The reason why he's a problem is because even if this is just a tiny bit of the original signal, say, 30 dB down. That's a common n number to use in isolation. Even if it's 30 dB down, it's still many orders of magnitude stronger than the signal coming in, which means on the output of this mixer, you are going to have a huge DC term plus a very weak time varying signal. Cosine 2 pi ft is due to leaking? That's uh, cosine 2 pi ft would be leaking, yeah. The carrier wa waveform mixing in on itself. If it was a conventional receiver, if you were generating, if you were, if you were just trying to receive any signal RX through an antenna and you try to mix it, Some of this will get on here, and you'll always get a big DC term coming out of your mixer. Now, if this is an intermediate frequency, instead of going straight to DC, so for example, let's say you had a 900 megahertz signal arriving at the receiver, and instead of a heterodyne receiver, you used a, oh, excuse me, instead of a homodyne receiver, you used a heterodyne receiver. That is, multiple frequency steps to get down and down convert your signal.
Let, then what you would do is pick a frequency for this oscillator here, make it say 800 megahertz or 850 megahertz. And so the output frequency that you would grab here would be 50 megahertz. It's a lot lower in frequency. You can build amplifiers and filters and clean up the signal more. What's more, you'll still have a DC term here, but it won't matter. Then you can run it through a low pass or a high pass filter and get rid of it. If you do 900 megahertz, you can still run it through a low pass or, or excuse me, a high pass filter to get rid of the DC component, but you're actually cutting into your signal now because your signal is centered at DC when it when it's comes to the output of this step. And that is highly problematic for a regular receiver. Now the reason why in backscatter we can get away with this homodyne architecture for a receiver is because in, in some ways it's still a problem but is not as much of a problem as the other self-interference mechanisms in a backscatter receiver. So remember, we're sending a sine wave out like this. Some of that sine wave is actually leaking back into our receive chain. Some of it is leaking from transmit to receive antenna. Some of it is reflecting. We can actually use the same transmit and receive antenna if we use a circulator to divide the, the directions of the signal, but there'll be leakage in that case as well. And there's also leakage from the environment. There's a lot of stuff around our tag, our walls, our chairs, our ceilings, that is reflecting a sine wave back into the receiver chain. And so we have this very difficult task of trying to listen to backscattered signals in the presence of a tone that emanates from our reader that is literally screaming a signal, ah, into your ear, making it difficult to figure out what exactly is being backscattered back, unless you're very careful. And so we're left with this conundrum where we use the homodyne receiver because it's a simple architecture, and the main problems that keep you from using it in a regular receiver aren't nearly as bad as the problems you're gonna have to deal with anyway because there's an intrinsic tone always coming back in your actual signal rather than only leaking in through the hardware. So we are going to have homodyne receiver problems anyway. So we are basically going forced to use this, or not forced, but it's beneficial to use this architecture because the problems aren't as big as our other problems. And we kind of have to deal with them in the same way. We're going to have to put a high pass filter, some sort of uh, capacitive block usually, before we do any signal processing on I and Q. And it turns out that we get a noise profile on that on a homodyne receiver that is colored and that's due to a dirty non-ideal carrier It is a sine wave with some skirts because the phase of the sine wave is wandering around through time. Even if we think we've got a perfect oscillator, we never have a pure spike in the frequency domain. There's always some skirts as the source is actually a little bit dirty. And some of that noise falls through our system. Another is the intrinsic one over F noise from electronic devices. So this is, these are um, noises that are modeled as one over F frequency dependent noise. One of the most common forms of noise at low frequencies is called flicker noise. 
if you've ever dealt with flicker noise of a transistor. It's particularly bad for field effect transistors, especially CMOS transistors. Um, and the reason is, if I draw my classical, so I have a gate, oh, excuse me, drain, and a source, and there's some sort of oxide insulator and some sort of gate here. Here's a channel that's doped. There's usually some sort of P, some sort of uh, insulator lightly doped or non-doped insulating material. Okay, this is sort of like the textbook picture you deal with whenever you uh, work with electronics in your semiconductors class, right? And the way that the field effect transistor works is that you can have varying degrees of current from source to drain by applying different voltages to the gate you can cause that channel to expand or deplete and therefore you can modulate the amount of current that goes from source to drain. Very simple. And they always draw the current like this, right? On your diagrams. You think, oh yes, current's going that way, that means the electrons are going the other way. And there's this smooth transition of electrons. When I put a voltage across D to S, I'm going to conduct electrons from left to right in my diagram and everything works out fine. But if you stop and think about it, they kind of fibbed a little bit in those undergraduate classes, right? You, if you apply a voltage across D to S, yeah, okay, you will have, let's do this. Which way does the field point? Away from positive to negative, which means the electrons in the system are actually going from left to right, right? Ben Franklin had a 50-50 shot at getting the polarity of the electric carrier right, and he got it wrong. So for evermore, we're gonna have to deal with negative electrons that travel in the opposite direction of the actual current. But remember, there are also fields this way, right? You have a, if you have a voltage at your gate, then there are fields pointing this way. Which means those electrons don't actually flow in a straight line. They porpoise through the channel. They'll come over here and bang against the insulator up here. And then they'll pop out and bang up again. And then as they make their way across the channel. So it's not this uniform, nice march of charges in one direction. Um, the vertical fields in the structure will cause the, char the free charges, namely the electrons, to bump into the, ins the insulator. And when they bump into the insulator, there's a probability that they will get trapped. There's a possibility that they'll get trapped there and then pop out at some undisclosed time later. So as a result, if you just have n current flowing here at, through DC, then what you actually see on the output, if you look at it clear carefully, you'll have your DC output and then flicker noise on top of it. Additive noise that depends on the size of the junction and has a low frequency bias to the type of interference that in, in and we usually model that with one over f power spectral density so people will call it one over f noise probably not the best model in the world because if you integrate across the entire frequency domain you'll find that you you pick up this singularity and you get an infinite amount of noise power. Well, that's not actually possible. So at some point up here in the high frequency regime, it dies off and it can't possibly be infinite all the way to zero anyway. But this one over F model is actually a pretty good model for this type of noise when you look at low frequencies. And that's in, in addition to the dirty non-ideal oscillators. And then on top of that, you also have 
nonlinear uh, devices that mix extra noise down into low frequency. So one of the things that we've had a lot of success with at Georgia Tech is using a specific model to describe backscatter modulation. We call it the orange noise model. And said, so in a wireless communications channel, when I mix down to baseband, I've still got my additive white Gaussian noise. And if we, you want to configure out what is this level when a power spectral density, which has units of watts per hertz, right? This is Boltzmann's constant times your system temperature. So it should be 1. Point, uh, was that 38 times 10 to the negative 23 joules per Kelvin. And this is your system temperature, which is probably 1,000 Kelvin or something like that. It's a function of the environment that your antenna sees plus the additive noise that your devices, especially the ones that are biased, your active devices like amplifiers and all introduce. Um, so this, this, this is all conventional. This is present in every wireless communication system ever built. The thing that we have to contend with now is that there is now a, an additional one over F to the alpha term in this receiver. And the alpha is a noise exponent that can be anywhere from, say, 1 to 2. Could possibly be more, but we've seen measured uh, noise exponents for different receiver change in, chains in different configurations. And sometimes we get 1, sometimes we get 1.5, sometimes we get close to 2. It depends on what we have. For example, I've seen instances where we measure a ex noise exponent of 1, so it's almost like flicker noise at that point. But then when we introduce a high-powered amplifier, it kind of abruptly steepens and gro goes up some, such that it gets up to, say, 1.5. That's even, even noisier, even more low frequency. And that has to do with the nonlinearity of the receiver channel. And then at some point, and this is the orange part of the description, you run this system through uh, a high pass filter and that will get rid of the reddest part of the noise. And so that's why we call it the orange noise model. Orange is the next color up from red. We get rid of the red, and, but we're still slanted towards those lower frequencies. So, in its most generic form, here's how we model our orange noise. In this region, above high pass, my noise power spectral density as a function of frequency is going to be KT sys over 2, and I should have said this, I've actually, I've got to divide that by 2, because there's actually a positive and a negative frequency spectrum, and so just to keep the accounting correct, the way that we do things in RF engineering, we need to 
a two there to denote that there's also power on the mirror image of what I'm drawing. And then one plus F sub B over F raised to the alpha. F sub B is the knee frequency. It's where the additive white Gaussian noise is equal to the colored noise. That sort of break point where they start to dominate one another, or uh, equal to one another. One starts to dominate to the left, the other starts to dominate on the right. And so it would look sort of like this in total. Some point here is your break point frequency. And then at your cutoff frequency, F sub H, the noise falls off. Okay. Now, let's talk about transmitting data through that channel. If I just took a bunch of ones and zeros and randomly started to send them through that channel, what would that look like? Well, what is the power spectral density of a bunch of ones and zeros sent using square pulses? And remember, this is like the 1950s, like the on-off of load modulation really can only make square pulses. We don't have the ability in those types of communication links to do analog pulse shaping. So we're stuck with a basis function that is basically a box. So what is the, what is the Fourier transform of a box? Sink. So what would the power spectral density be? Sync squared, that's right, that's right. And if I graph it at baseband, sync squared looks like this. Eventually these humps diminish. But the main frequency content, where's the maximum frequency content? Go ahead and draw some of the negative as well. It's right there, right there hanging out at low frequencies. But if this is what my channel looks like here, then no matter how I work my sync function or how, how I send my data, the maximum frequency content is always right here, where either A, it's going to be filtered if I make the high pass high enough. And if I don't make the high pass high enough, I've got all this extra noise that's coming in through the system. So what is a person to do? So one way to minimize this is to just transmit very, very fast, right? But that turns out to be not a very effective way. You can kind of see why it helps, right? If this is your model, here's my orange noise, and I transmit with very short pulses. One, zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, one, one. Then in the frequency domain, that means my sync squared power spectral density, my signal power is going to be spread over a very long smear in frequency. And so if I have to lose a little bit of this, then most of the signal energy is out here. And hopefully, in most scenarios, I can detect what I'm sending. That's one way around that problem. It's not very energy efficient because it means you have to switch very quickly. right? Power, it takes energy to do that. So then the next thing that people like to do is employ something called a channel code. This is a way to encode data that circumvents certain problem areas in your channel. This also is called a modulation code. 
And it's also called a recording code. And so the idea is choose a recording scheme so that your power spectral density of your desired signal has a null at f equals to zero. So for example, in the world of contactless integration circuits, integrated circuits and uh, what we would call the Gen 1 UHF RFID standard. That em employed a type of channel call code called F2F. Stands for frequency, double frequency. And what this looked like is whenever I wanted to send a one, I would divide my bit period into four smaller periods. And I would send a signal that looked like this. I would backscatter load state one for two beats and then backscatter load state two for two beats. And if I wanted to send a zero, I would backscatter Again, dividing into four equal parts. One beat, and then the next beat, and then I would repeat. So you can see I kind of have two different square we waves at different frequencies. One is the double of the frequency of the other. And this is a special kind of code that we call a balance code. Because at least over this four blocks, of signal, I always have 50% high, 50% low. I never have an imbalance, like a 1, 1. If I viewed these as individual coded bits, I would call this 1, 1, 0, 0. I always have the exact same ones as I have 0, right? In this case, I have 1, 0, 1, 0. And that's what we mean by balance. If I have the same number of ones and zeros in this type of signal, then I have automatically removed the data uh, at f equals to zero. I've made a signal whose power spectral density has a null at zero. And this was one of the first uh, UHF RFID standards. In fact, this is how your data in your um, swipe cards are encoded. So if you have a magnetic stripe on a card, like a credit card or a bank card or a hotel card or whatever, there are, I think there are three tracks of magnetic information down those strips. Uh, there are ones and zeros and they're encoded using an F2F frequency, double frequency. We basically use four magnetic domains to encode each data bit. Why do we have to use four domains in this kind of fashion? Well, there's a couple reasons. First of all, if you're reading this from a swiped card, the speed at which you swipe, swipe is not constant. It's neither constant nor is it consistent, right? Some people are fast swipers. Mulan, you're probably not a fast swiper. Are you a fast swiper? I'm a slow swiper. Slow swiper. He's careful. That's good. Good engineer. So you, Mulan comes up here and, and he sees a, a, a signal. It's probably very consistent, but it's slow because he's very methodical. And then let's go ahead and since he isn't here, let's pick on Dylan. The Dylan swiper is probably all over the place. Nice and slow to start with gradually increasing speed until it's lightning fast coming out of the 
the swipe. Well, you know, how do you synchronize the frequency of such a, a signal coming out of your magnetic read heads? And furthermore, those are AC coupled recent read heads. They can't read DC components. And so all of the signals have to be balanced. If you had, you know, a long one like this, and then a long zero like this, then chances are in that AC coupled channel, this would degrade. And it would de destroy the detectability of the signal. If you had a whole bunch of ones in a row, what we would call a run, a run of ones or zeros, this would decay to zero and flatline completely. You would have no idea what those last two or three bits were, even if you could make out the initial one in the sequence. Okay. So, frequency to frequency, double frequency, F2F. Very effective at overcoming these colored noise channels. Could easily get through an orange noise channel if it worked fast enough. However, it's not very efficient. We're using four encoded bits for every single data bit that we're sending. Luckily, things like the magnetic swipe card or a UHF RFID card or uh, an inductive contactless uh, tap card, that those are the type of systems that use this type of encoding. Speed is not of the essence. We're just getting an identification number off of something. If you want to send more data, though, this has to be improved, which is why in a su subsequent generation of RFID, we went to something called FM0, where if you want to send a 1, first of all, you have a guaranteed transition after each data bit. And then, if you want to send a 1, you count, divide the interval into two equal valued time segments, and you transmit high or low. We call that zero, uh, 1, 0. And if you want to send a 0, then you can just send the whole thing. However, the fact that there's a guaranteed transition means that the polarity of the, each of these symbols flips every time. So for example, let's say I wanted to send the data sequence 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. In time, let me do red for the bit periods, the data bit periods. I got five of them. And then each of those has a coded, two coded bits for every bit transmitted. So over here, I transmit a one. I'll start one high, zero low. And then I guarantee my transition back to here. And then I send a zero. Whoop. One, two, and then I guarantee a transition down there. I send a zero again. Zero says I said the same things, this time with a flip polarity. One, two. Again, guaranteed transition. One, zero for my one transmission. And then I guarantee a transition. One, zero, and so forth. Now, look at the interval. I just picked this, these bits at random, five bits at random. The five bits by themselves are not balanced, right? I've got three ones and two zeros. However, you'll notice I have one, 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 five ones and five zeros. This is balanced. Doesn't matter what I transmit, I, I'm balanced at that point. Now the way I've presented it here and the way it's defined in spec specifications, FM zero, frequency modulation zero, is uh, 
a protocol that produces balance signals and has memory in the sense of the way I've drawn it, this zero state depended on the previous state, right? This was high, and because I have guaranteed transitions, I got to go down low here. And then I have a guaranteed flip up here. And if I had had another zero in there, then I would have had to start my one in a flipped configuration as well. Always get balanced, but that we would say that the modulation scheme has memory because the exact ones and zeros that you transmit depend on what you sent the previous bit. Now there's a very similar type of modulation scheme that is again used for systems that have difficulty recovering the speed of transition transmission. We take that for granted nowadays because most of our communication systems use discipline oscillators to transmit and receive and you know we know within a fraction of a percent what the actual transmit frequency is. It's very different for the, the swipe cards or some of these chips that have very poor um, internal oscillators, for example. So, but in old systems, especially from the 1950s and 60s, the, some of the first digital systems that transmitted ones and zeros, those systems had difficulties with clock recovery. And so one of the nice things about FM0 is that there's always a guaranteed transition every bit period. So you can use that as kind of a clocking signal to drive the rest of your logic and decoding. Okay, there's a closely related form of mo modulation called Manchester encoding. This was developed in the 40s and 50s and 60s. And you basically take your data sequence, however long it is. So here in time, let's call this one, zero, one, one, zero, one, zero. And then you multiply it by a square wave that's twice the frequency, like this. And so what you get out is actually kind of similar to FM0, except now the, the guaranteed transmission, the transition is always in the middle of the bit rather than the edge of the bits. So if you think of this as an ex exclusive or multiplication, you'll get something like this. And you can see that this balances it in the same way. In fact, if you looked at the power spectral density of Manchester encoding or FM0, you actually get the exact same result. The power spectral density looks something like this. It has a beautiful DC null here in the middle as a result of the uh, balancing act because this is a balanced code which may, means that you can transmit it nicely through that orange noise channel and it's impervious to this low frequency noise. So just by adding that extra bit really Okay, so now, how do we... I should probably take a break here. I've gone past my break time. Let's take a brief break. And I'll go, home, go back down and get a few uh, diagrams. Here we go, back after break. And uh, what I have here is a uh, capture of some actual data from a receiver of the same type that we diagrammed earlier with 
antenna coupling, backscatter signal reflecting in here, internal mixing, all producing uh, two measured noise spectra. So actually, it's kind of interesting. These, this data was taken at 5.8 gigahertz, so it's up at the microwave frequency bands. And I don't know if you can see, Let's see if I can draw here. So there, there are two noise captures taken here. First of all, this is plotted on a log-log axis. I have dB relative to noise floor on the vertical axis, and then the logarithmic frequency. And of course, the reason why I do that is because for 1 over F to the alpha type noise, when I plot it like that, then that ramp up at low frequencies becomes a straight line. And the slope of that straight line lets me figure out what alpha, alpha is. So for example, here you have some, this is the same backscatter receiver, and you have white noise through here. Whoop, I'm highlighting instead of drawing. Well, that's fine. Same through there. And then over here, when you get to the high, uh, the low frequency cutoff or high frequency cutoff, you see the, the signal kind of falls off. And then down at low frequencies, there's a break point. In this receiver, it's about 100 kilohertz. And then that ramps up, slopes up. And you find that the slope of that line is 1, or negative 1, since it's going upward. And then at some point, you get a cutoff. Cutoff frequency at low frequency is around 20 kilohertz for this device. So this point, these last couple of points aren't probably very meaningful because on a logarithmic graph, it's only a few of them anyway. And then interesting, when we take that receiver, that was the that's the noise profile when the receiver is on but the transmitter isn't. In other words, this reader isn't transmitting anything; it's just listening. So this is noise that's mixing down through the channel. Then. When we turn the system on, it gets even worse. First of all, the break-even point, that F sub B, goes up to about one megahertz. The noise flattens out, and then again, we're hitting five, meg two megahertz cutoff here, and it just starts to fall off the table after that. The slope increases. It's a slope of about 1.5 before it gets to cut off the low frequency cutoff, and then just dies. And interestingly, you know this is real data because look at this. Look at this thing in here. This is a frequency spike. This is a spurious clock frequency at 480 kilohertz being introduced by the RF hardware itself or the digital hardware that happens to be on the same RF board. It's leaking in. It's going to cause some interference too. I think it's interesting to see very lifelike data, actual data taken to uh, illustrate noise processes on these receivers and how we, we develop models for a colored information channel. And I alluded to this earlier in the lecture, but this is really a similar problem that you have to contend with in a lot of real hardware communication systems. So for example, in a hard drive platter where the magnets are spinning around on the platter and you've got a little reed head, usually a little loop or a little you know, tiny coil, that you're using the fact that These are the little domains on the hard drive platter. You've got a little coil, or some pickup loop that's moving across these, measuring the flux. You can only really measure the changes, right? The coil is moving across the south pole of magnet here. The flux is going down into the system. You know you're only going to see a change in flux on the border. So the signal that you get out of here is really more like change, 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 change. It's not even well-defined bits. So it's a channel that has a very high cutoff, low frequency cutoff, 
high low frequency cutoff. And so you can't modulate data straight up. And what's more, there's a lot of noise down here as well, in addition to just regular thermal noise. Why? Because the servos of the motor are spinning. And that creates low frequency noise due to the, the way that the windings and brushes and other things that you implement on a servo to get it to turn around will, in, will modulate and introduce itself onto the communications channel as jamming. So there'll be noise that ramps up down here anyway, even if you didn't have this cut off. Uh, likewise, in an optical reader, if you have an optical disc, well, you don't have a DC coupled channel in that instance. You're basically taking a reflected signal um, and changing the reflection so that you either get light reflected or no light reflected. And that's your one and zero. Again, you've got servos for those types of uh, di spinning disk systems and that noise will often couple into your communications channel so that even if it's not an AC coupled system like the magnetic readhead, you will introduce noise at these low frequency bands. So the next thing I want to do I do some derivations of some models. One other thing I wanted to illustrate. Here's a nice illustration of what happens to digital data when you transmit it through these channels, especially if you don't code it properly. So here's some sample data that I, I wrote up here. And notice I've intentionally put in a section that has a run, a lot of ones or zeros that's the same. And I also put a session up here that I would it's not necessarily a run, but it's a bias. It's where you have a bunch of ones mixed in with some zeros. And so if you put the signal with additive white Gaussian noise, this has a signal to noise ratio of about 10 dB. You see, 10 dB is pretty decodable, right? I look at that signal, I say, oh yeah, I can tell what the ones are and what the zeros are. I can see my runs, I can see my biases pretty easily. Now, what happens if you, you have colored noise, if you run the same signal through a colored uh, noise setup where you try to filter out that low frequency component? You can see what happens. Look at this. I hit the run of zeros and the low frequency cutoff. This is a first order, first pass, uh, first order high pass filter. So it's just made with like a, a, a resistor and a capacitor trying to block the DC component. You can see that that signal dies, dives down towards the line so that I can't even really make up, make out faithfully what's going on right here. Then all of a sudden I get some ones and zeros again. And even though I've got it broken up by some occasional zeros, this bias of ones still tends down close to here such that it becomes difficult by just doing a threshold test seeing which is a one and which is a zero. And so in case D, we don't run it through a filter, but we add orange noise, and that is low frequency noise that has that one over F characteristic. And you see that some of the same problems exist. You can see now that the low frequency noise, because it's kind of dominated by surges and humps, it's like the ocean, right, uh, on the seashore. You don't get a lot of low frequency high amplitude components, you got, or you don't get a lot of high frequency, high amplitude components, you get a lot of low frequency amplitude components. So these surges and waves that come through in the noise and add to the signal start to push the decision boundary around. You'll notice in this region, for example, where there's a bias running through, a bias of, of uh, ones, it becomes difficult to tell to just through threshold testing which are the ones and which are the zeros because that dotted blue line represents the threshold that you should be testing against. Likewise over here at the beginning of this bias this thing has dropped down somewhat and again it becomes difficult because of the surging and undulating of the noise. So you'll see that you can't really win right you, if you allow the low frequency noise and you're going to distort your signal unless you balance it. And if you try to filter it out, you're still going to distort your signal unless you balance it. And then here over 
i have a few illustrations of what manchester data looks like i'll put this uh, paper on the website i don't believe it's up there yet Okay, now, now for a, a little derivation. Okay, if we have an additive white noise Gaussian channel, then the optimal linear filter for detecting digital symbols is the matched filter. What does this look like? Well, I've got a signal coming in, and then I run it through my matched filter. And then, oops, I sample and hold. Every T sub B for a binary signal. This match filter, what shape does it have? It basically has a time reversed copy of my original symbol X. So that if my X is pulses coming in here, I've put ones and zero on square wave pulses. This is time. Then, well, what happens when I go over here and flip it? So I flip this signal over here and then I shift it by TB. Well, it turns out that I get the exact same thing for h of t as a function of time. When I convolve this impulse response that has the same shape as my transmitted signal, what I get on the output of here should be a triangle function whose peak correlation here occurs at t equals to tb. So that's the thing that I'm sampling. And what this really is is a correlation filter. I've got a signal that in this case we know it's going to have a sinc squared power spectral density. We have a filter that has a sinc response so it would have a sinc squared power spectral density as well. So the output is actually going to be like a power spectral density of sinc to the fourth sine x over x to the fourth type, or sine t over t to the fourth. <clears throat> so it's not going to look like my original signal, but it's going to give me the most faithful estimate of what that symbol's amplitude was at that particular point in time. And that's all I want for a digital reconstruction, to figure out whether a one or a zero was sent. Now, how do you track power in here? OK, let's say I now map have the following signal in here. I have x of t plus Gaussian noise of t. And I'm sending it through my same matched filter. Keep in mind that this matched filter mat doesn't matter what I'm actually transmitting. If I'm not transmitting square wave, if I'm transmitting little hump pulses like that, then my h function becomes a little hump pulse. And when I correlate these, I probably get something like this. A nice correlation peak at T sub B. And that's what I use. And theory says that's the best way to detect the signal with the linear filter. OK, so I have a signal to noise ratio here to start with. That's the ratio of my signal power to noise power. And I said that. This gives you the, the best estimate, the best signal-to-noise ratio 
for an estimate of your peak, your correlation peak. That's the highest possible signal to noise ratio for a linear filter. So what is that signal to noise ratio? Okay. So when the output here, my output here is going to be x of t convolved with h of t. And this is going to be n of t convolved with h of t. Okay. So signal to noise ratio here I have a signal that has power call it p sub x if I'm convolving it with the exact same signal in a correlation I'm gonna get p of x squared in this case I've got a p of n and I have another function that has a power p of x I have a p sub n times p sub x in the bottom. p of x cancel. So what I'm going to get really is p of x over p of n in a static matched filter. And another way to write this is that we have my signal power divided by Boltzmann's constant bandwidth times my system temperature. And that's going to be the signal to noise ratio of that estimate here coming out of my matched filter. The ratio of how much energy is in the signal and how much energy is actually in the noise. Now, what happens when you have colored noise? If you have colored noise, then instead of a matched filter, you have to do one extra step. So the input to my detector, here I've got my digital information, x of t, my signal. And then I have, say, colored noise. S of n of f, where this S of n is no longer a constant. It's no longer KTB. It's some, I gave an example for the orange noise channel that we use. It's whatever. It's just a function of frequency. So the first thing that you have to do is run it through a whitening filter. H sub W. The magnitude of the whitening filter squared is the inverse of the power spectral density. One over noise power spectral density as a function of that. It turns out there are an infinite number of filters that satisfy this equation. Right, because only the magnitude squared has to undo the, the frequency selectivity of the noise. Now it turns out there's only like uh, there, a subset of that is what you actually would implement. You need something causal first of all, and so that means that if you want a causal filter, that uh, you really have to to pick just one value. There's one value for H of W that'll make this work. And you can work with like quasi-causal filters and things like that that 
would give you a range of things that approximate a whitening filter in this instance. But the point is when you submit no transmit noise like this through this filter, what you're left now with is h of w of t convolved with your signal. That's, those are now the information, that's the information signal coming through. And now the noise that you're adding to here is additive white Gaussian noise. So if you do this step, all you have to do at that point is now make a matched filter. that then samples the signal. Sample and hold every T sub B, every bit period. The only difference is now when you design your filter, you're matching it to this instead of just X of T. So that the impulse response of this guy is now HW T B minus T convolved with X of T B minus T and correlating with that quantity. I won't go ahead and, and uh, derive it, but the static matched filter SNR is given by 1 over R sub B integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of the power spectral density of your signal times the power spectral density of your noise as a function of frequency. It's a very elegant equation that belies a lot of behavior going on in this system. And so now we can see why is it important to balance and change the power spectral density of our signal to match a channel that is a channel that is uh, colored. Because if my noise frequency has a null down at f equal to zero, that's going to cause, that's in the denominator, it's going to cause it to blow up. So unless there's a null in the numerator to counteract that, what is my SNR going to be? Oh, uh, this would be bits per second. So yeah, hertz, essentially. So I would, I, any null in here is like basically going to blow this up. if I'm not careful. I can deal with it if I null it out. And in fact, this is actually the second technique that I've shown you. This is sort of the textbook way on how to deal with colored noise in a communication system. The problem for us, and really anyone actually, is our noise is going to depend on our environment, right? We said in the orange noise model that we've got some noise that looks like this. This is our S of n as a function of f. And there's some sort of magic bait breakpoint frequency. That's one of the parameters in the model. The other model was where's the high pass cut off and what's the slope alpha of that so with just a handful of parameters, we come up with a simple model that we can use for modeling these uh, low-powered radio links that are operating with backscatter. Um, and it models a whole bunch of other types of links, too, that you may encounter in, in electrical engineering. So 
why can't we use or why don't we use this type of generalized match filter with the whitening? Well, part of the reason is because that noise profile, even though that's a good model, those parameters will change over time. So we already saw on the same hardware how the alpha changes depending on whether we had the transmitter amplifier on or not. Okay, that's fine. We're always going to transmit, right? That, then we wouldn't. Get, that's how we get signals. So let's use 1.5 instead of a slope of one for that hardware. Okay, that's not going to change. Well, what about F sub B? The thermal noise generally does not change. However, the magnitude of that reflected noise, because it, some of it is dependent on self-jamming, some of it's a function of nonlinear properties, that F sub B will shift around depending on what environment you're operating in. If I'm up on the rooftop and I'm kind of transmitting, trying to get a data from a sensor off of that skyscraper over there, well, I've got a fairly open air channel. I'm not going to get a lot reflected in. Maybe I'm using a bi-static configuration where I'm transmitting with one antenna. It's isolated from another antenna that's being used to receive and pull that information out. Well, if that's the case, then I'm in good shape because uh, I will have a very small F sub B, maybe down in the 100 megahertz or less, or 100 kilohertz or less. If I'm in a cluttered environment like this room, or maybe I amp up my transmit power, that F sub B will start to move to the right. And so if I really want a Gaussian, or excuse me, a generalized matched filter implementation, I need the ability to tune in a different whitening filter as F sub B slides around. And there are some things that help us out too. A lot of modern day backscatter receivers will employ some sort of interference cancellation. So this problem where I have an oscillator, I'm running something through a power amplifier, I'm sending something out here. First of all, one of the things they like to do is instead of drawing off the signal here, you can come up here in front of the power amplifier pick off your signal, probably run it through some sort of attenuator, which is kind of counterintuitive. I transmit a signal and then I attenuate it. But here we're trying to get at a copy of what's coming out here. And then you run it through some sort of dynamic amplitude and phase adjustment. and you subtract that off of whatever comes into your receiver. Then you run it and demodulate it in a conventional fashion. So this gets rid of what's called the self-jamming problem. It doesn't really get rid of it, it just reduces it. If you think about how this would work, you're sending out a wave. If anything reflects back in here, you basically have a, a loop algorithm to monitor the power coming off of this subtraction operation, and then adjust the phase and the amplitude to minimize the output. You're basically trying to minimize the output here in this direction. And then whatever tag is actually in here sending data by flipping back and forth, back and forth, load modulating quickly, that's going to drop right through this algorithm because there's no way for this to keep up with that and then you can demodulate it. And this actually helps with some of the problems. You can subtract up about 30 dB of your self-jamming. This is called an interference canceling receiver. This partly solves your problem, but you're still left with a large DC component or a low frequency component in terms of noise and self interference. So it helps, but it doesn't solve the problem. You still need to implement some sort of codes. So when we come back on Wednesday, I'll talk about some more sophisticated modulation coding that you can use to
code in a backscatter system. And then we'll pretty be, much be done with uh, backscatter for information modulation. Then we'll move on to a few other interesting topics in this world of wireless without batteries.